fun. Okay, I don't care. All right. Okay, I'd like to call to order the City of Bayport City Council meeting of May 1st, 2023. We all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Matt, you want to call the roll? Yes, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Carlson. Here. Councilmember Gilmore. Here. Councilmember Dahl. Present. Councilmember Hill. Here. Mayor Hansen. Here. All present. All right. Do we have approval of the agenda for tonight? I move to approve the agenda as presented. All right. Thanks, Katie. I'll Whatever. second it. All right. Thanks, Connie. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Uh, proclamations, commendations, petitions, and announcements. The April Recycling Award recipient is James Jablonski on 5th Street North, and he will be um, rewarded for his recycling efforts from the county. And then we move on to the open forum where we do have a visitor tonight. Um, Want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. All right. Uh, hello, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Connor Schaefer. I'm a senior planner in Washington County. Today I'm here to present um, the Middle St. Croix Valley Regional Trail Master Plan. I'll just mention here that the... The purpose of today is to review the whole project and process with you all and for you all to consider a resolution of support. To begin with the agenda for my presentation, I'm going to start with some terms and some introduction for the project. I'll talk about the public engagement that we did for this as well. And then we will also go over some implementation considerations that are important for policymakers such as yourself. And then we'll talk about the route alternatives that came out of the process and the final recommendation that we're moving forward with. And then I'll end with some next steps. So the first term that you'll hear me use or you've already heard me use is regional trails. That might be a new concept for some folks. They're really trails that serve a regional audience. So think of them like the county highway system uh, plays in, the, in the, the roadway network here. So these are bringing people to and from different destinations, not just the local folks, but people across the county, and in this case, across states line, lines as well. We like to think of them as the tree trunks for our trail systems that other local systems can kind of branch into and out of. It's kind of the, the concept that we like to use. There are design standards that come along with uh, these trails. There's a picture of it. Uh, kind of a, a cross section and, and a picture of how it looks like in, in real life on this slide. And that means we we're talking about a wide enough trail that makes it accessible for folks, meaning 10 feet wide with clear zones on either side and ideally a significant separation between the trail users and the road, uh, people using the road, the traffic on the road. Um, a great example in that picture also shows there's some wayfinding involved as well and that you can see that it's wide enough for people to kind of use bi-directional traffic. So this is like a upgrade over like a city sidewalk. We're talking about like a, a wider trail. So those are the type of trails that the county build and, and we use the term regional trail. So this is the, that's the type of trail we're thinking about when we're... Before we move on from plans. that cross section, is it appropriate to interrupt with a Please. question? Yeah. Um, just because we're here, um, I noticed it says trail lighting as necessary. Is that something that is typically you i'm just trying to visualize bike paths i've been on or is that usually more of a used in a city limits situation um not in you know, where you'd be out in fields or more of a rural setting is that yep. accurate mayor and council member exactly the term you like to use is that these trails are designed right sized and right amenity for the community at their end so if we're going through an urban part of the county where there's typical street lighting that that would be something we would consider. If we're not, then we, you know, we, we'd right size it for the community that we're moving through. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, good question, John. All right, next slide here. I'll briefly introduce the concept of master plans for folks. 
Um, these are really vision documents provide the guidance on where an alignment of a future regional trail will go. We also talk about trail improvements, uses, and facilities along the route. And then we also look at opportunities to do corridor resource management, if that's an opportunity for some of the adjacent properties um, kind of within the trail corridor. Why are these master plans important? Well, first, they, uh, they, they allow these trails to be built with state and regional funding. That includes right-of-way and land acquisition if needed, the actual construction or development of the trail, and also a small reimbursement for operation and maintenance for these trails. I think maybe the most important reason at all is that final point, which is doing these master plans allow us to engage with the communities and the cities and the stakeholders about what the county plans on doing um, in the future with, with future projects. I like to call this like kind of step zero in a long process for the trail to eventually get built. It's not even step one, it's kind of step zero. Um, it gets the conversations going um, for, for future implementation down, down the line. And the engagement is a key part of that. So Connor, how, how solid is the master plan? Is it something that can be changed down the road or is this a final version? It's really the best we can do right now and yeah. the best we can project in the future. So there are amendments that you can make to these master plans, um, but really it's kind of sets the expectations directions for the, city, for the county's future investments. So yes, um, the, they, they do change and have changed and evolved. We also, uh, you can deviate from, you know, this is like a, you know, you might see like a straight line in these maps. If there are small deviations from that, those are totally fine too. Um, we're kind of 10,000 feet up, okay. really, is kind of a, how, how detailed we're getting with these plans. Thanks. Yeah, it allows us to be flexible for implementation. All right, let's talk about the specific corridor that we focused on over the past, you know, just over a year. It's called the Middle St. Croix Valley, and it's 14 miles. It starts in the north at the boom site, which is uh, in Stillwater Township, just north of downtown Stillwater, and the south terminus is in downtown Afton. In between that area, we're talking 11 different St. Croix Valley towns and cities. Um, once developed, the idea is that all these communities are, are connected with the regional trail. Um, and I think it was really important to, to shout out some of the important destinations within this corridor. Obviously the boom site, downtown, uh, the downtowns, including Stillwater, Bayport, um, and Afton, a lot of the natural areas and river destinations as well. A timeline for these master plans includes uh, starting in the spring with visioning and site analysis. We do a significant amount of engagement during the summer months when people are out in the parks using trails and things like that. In the fall and winter, we went into a route development stage where we were putting lines on maps and evaluating those potential routes. And now we're moving, um, as winter turns into spring here, uh, we were moving through these, these final phases of, of the approval process and we're drafting the final document. All these projects, before we put any lines on the map or anything, we start with project goals. We work with the public and in our uh, committee, our, our small stakeholder committee, to identify what are the goals for a project specifically within this corridor. And I'll review these just quickly with you all right now. First, safety, accessibility, and comfort. Second, connectivity. Third, natural resources. Fourth, equity. And fifth, implementation. And I'll call back to these as we move forward and we talk about the route evaluation because these this really set the framework for how we evaluated which routes um, would move forward and which routes wouldn't. I want to review a little bit about some of the public engagement that we did for this project. You can see kind of a, this isn't really a comprehensive list, but these are some of the highlights. I know that there was representation from the city at the elected of officials work session, um, which I think happened uh, I think last fall, and then we did attend the Bayport Farmers Market as well here in, in downtown Bayport, which is a great experience as well. Throughout the project, we've been meeting with city staff and different project stakeholders, kind of more on a one-to-one -one or small group basis, to work through some of the challenges and issues throughout the quarter. So I did want to highlight that too. You can see some of the project partners that I think may be most relevant to folks here um, in, in bold under that under that column as well. I do want to call out a public engagement survey that we did. We received over a thousand responses. There's some really good insights that we took from that survey, but I do want to highlight that, uh, that this part of the slide that's called the continuum exercise. And for folks who did participate in the elected officials meeting, we, we did this exercise there. 
This is an exercise that helps understand or helps show the trade-offs involved with planning these projects. So not this trail can't be everything to everyone. Uh, that's something that you know, we wish we could do, but that's not the reality. Um, so we asked folks, uh, would you prefer a trail like this or this, or maybe somewhere in between, or maybe you have a slight preference one way or the other. So how this worked is that we had on one side of the spectrum, we asked folks if they have a preference for a destination or indirect trail, something that's more meandering, maybe something that's a little bit less direct, something that um, folks maybe use more recreationally versus a connector direct trail, something that's trying to get to A to B in the shortest distance for folks more interested in getting to the places they need to get to as quickly as possible. And kind of aggregate across the communities, there was a preference for that destination indirect trail. So that's what we found when you know, we aggregated all, all um, where people kind of fell on the, on the spectrum. There. We asked kind of in the same concept, we asked folks on one side if they prefer a new trail corridor or utilizing some existing trails. There are a lot of existing trails in this corridor too. And there's really no preference, kind of people dialed that right in the middle, <laughs> um, So, uh, which was good to know too. We also asked folks if they had a preference for river views or upland or rural uh, views, which kind of pulled possible in this corridor, which is, which is really cool. There was a slight preference for the river views. And then we asked folks about natural areas versus downtown connections. And there was a preference for natural areas. So I just want to call this out in the fact that these trails do contain trade-offs. And it's the reality for planning these. Um, and that's something that uh, we'll kind of see how that shows uh, as we move through the presentation here. Now, we received thousands of comments, um, open houses, the public engagement survey, these, these small meetings, going to farmers markets, things like that. So it's tough to boil it down, but if we had to, we, we boiled it down to this list. These are probably the things that kind of came up the most often. So first was highlighting local parks and destinations. That was really important for folks. Second is to making connections between the communities. So we talked to folks from Bayport that wanted to go down to Afton or people from Lakeland that wanted to go all the way up to Stillwater and kind of vice versa. Third, to explore loop opportunities. So by the nature of these trails, we're talking tree trunks, you know, we're going from A to B, but are there opportunities within there that we can make connections to create these loops? Um, that people are really you know, attracted to the idea that they can go from one area and come all the way back, and they are not like repeating the route or anything mm -hmm. like that. We see that at the St. Croix Crossing Loop, and that's really kind of brought that idea to uh, like in people's minds. It's kind of front of people's minds as far as loops. Um, next one was providing views of the river where feasible. We'll point out that just because you're close to the river doesn't mean you can see it. Sometimes actually the further away you are from the river, the better you see it. <laughs> um, so that was kind of interesting to, to look at view sheds, which is something we looked at. Um, but people were drawn to that. Next was fostering stewardship of area natural resources where, our, where feasible. We also wanted to make sure that we were designing a trail that was wide enough to accommodate a range of users. We talked to people who loved biking and that was their favorite thing. We talked to people who only walked and that's sort of the only thing. We talked to people who were on, in wheelchairs and that was the only way they were able to use these trails. We talked to a bunch of different trail users and something that kind of cut across all of them is that I want to feel safe on these trails and in that case like I feel safer the wider the trail is the safer I feel so that was an important kind of design piece to, to, to carry forward and then finally how important clear wayfinding is and frequent and high quality amenities for trails so if these are regional trails and we're attracting people from across the region it needs to have amenities to reflect that okay next piece of this presentation is going to highlight some implementation considerations these are some policies that are relevant to these trails, regional trails in general. The first is that um, there's a cost share policy that the county has that applies to these projects. Regional trails, in this case, the county will contribute 50% to the initial implementation of the, of the regional trails. Once those trails are built, we will assume 100% responsibility for future replacement and repaving of those uh, regional trails. The expectations on their operations and maintenance side, um, it's really kind of a joint uh, effort here. So the county will take responsibility for waste re and recycling pickups, trailheads, kiosks, and graffitis on, on county land, if, if that's, um, or within county right of way, if that, uh, we, we don't have, we have issues of that with our existing regional trails, but if they were to pop up, we'd be responsible for those. And the county does do uh, seasonal mowing. Now working with local agencies, if, if they prefer or, look, or do this within their city, uh, they're able to enter into a joint powers agreement to do the winter plowing is optional. 
and then kind of minor maintenance. So some communities choose to do more frequent mowing um, in one of our regional trails, for example. Um, so that's, that's uh, we work with local agencies to do some of that as well. So I wanna call out some of the uh, strategies and opportunities that go along with these policies. Um, we understand that when we talk to publics, the public about these projects, we get really positive feedback. Um, and, but I think what comes up with a lot of conversations with folks like policymakers is like, well, what about the costs, right? And we wanna make sure that we measure and account for that in our evaluation process. And it's very important to the county's process that that is something that we consider when we look at these projects. Um, not only that, uh, do we factor that into the master plan, but once the master plan is approved, we work with agencies to identify funding sources to reduce that cost burden. Here are some ideas listed here. There are grant opportunities that grow really every, every month. There's, a new, there's new opportunities out there on the federal state level for um, that trail projects are, are really popular for those, for those grants. Land donation opportunities, we'll work with local agencies where that's possible. And then development agreements. So if there's a corridor that's along a piece of land that we'll develop, we can request right of way or request the developers to, to help build that trail. And that's a key way for us to build some of these trails, especially in one of the, some of the more developing parts of the county. So that's been successful for us too. Um, so all of, the, all of this is to say this, is that this master plan is the key to really unlocking those other funding sources and kind of allows us to start pursuing those. Um, and so that the, the master plan is, is not the, the final piece of this. This is, like I said, step zero. It also gives us a chance to look at where we can plan this into our capital improvement plan or work with local agencies on capital projects that you all are pursuing and maybe do a joint project together, take advantage of economies of scales that way. There's some advantages of, of, of that as well. Definitely not gonna go through this slide just to say that this is just one list of the funding sources that the county tracks and looks at el for eligible projects. Um, so that, like I said, there are, there are ways to, take, to get some of these trails paid for that is out there. Okay, next set of slides here is to talk about the route alternatives. Um, so uh, it's fairly difficult when you have a 14 mile corridor and you've got a lot of ways to get from A to B, you've got to start somewhere. Well, for us, it started as that first bullet point which was spaghetti at the wall. We just drew a bunch of lines on a map and just said, let's see what could potentially work. Stream big, throw everything at the wall. When we went through that exercise and worked with our technical advisory committee and worked with city staffs and other stakeholders and just some basic engineering analysis, there were a lot of low hanging fruit. That was very easy to identify is that this isn't possible for one reason or the other. There's an engineering problem um, there that doesn't meet the city's goals or the city's already looked at that or just other things like that. Low hanging fruit kind of was that first cut in that initial uh, assessment. Then we worked into phase two. So we, we had some routes that kind of came out of that process and we mapped them all and we graded them. Basically, we took those five goals, those five goals that I mentioned earlier, we established performance measures on each of those five goals, like little data points, and we graded each segment on each of those five goals. So that graph on the bottom, um, and I can go into this much detail as possible, probably, you know, it'd take much longer than I probably have today, um, but it, it is shared with, with uh, City Administrator um, Klein and, and is available for those interested, but we could see which segment really met those goals that we talked about earlier. And I want to call that out that we could just take the top scoring segments because they would make no sense. Nobody would be able to really follow that or navigate a route like that. So we had to add the, the boots on the ground knowledge and just know that this evaluation process wasn't prescriptive. It wasn't just, you know, completely only data driven. We had to have the data um, complement some of the boots on the ground knowledge that we acquired throughout exploring this corridor. Um, so wanted to kind of set the stage for folks about how we kind of came through and, and um, pro how, the evaluation process, how, how we approached that. So Connor, did the five goals have priorities? Like, did you say, well, this was more important <laughs> than this? Because I would think it would get hard when you yeah. all so. Yeah, we, so uh, we said all goals were equally weighted. Oh, okay. So the implementation goal was just as important as safety, accessibility, and comfort, for example. Okay. Um, just if you just want to broadly, if you look at this, kind of the higher the graph, the, the higher it scored. Mm -hmm. But you can see that maybe you scored a little bit on the orange goal, um, or but you scored really high on the natural resource goal, which I think is the gray goal. You can see how that might balance out. Um, right. So you can see that 
some, uh, yeah, it really was a interesting data-driven process for that. Yeah. All right, I want to review how this played out here in Bayport, just um, to, to show how this process really um, works its way through a specific part of the corridor. And Bayport was probably one of the places we had the most lines on the map. Um, you can see the spaghetti at the wall map is what you see here. Um, and uh, what you see with the axes is kind of that first phase. Things, you know, we threw everything at the wall, and then what were some initial things, low-hanging fruit that were easy to kind of cross off to begin with. So that blue route, um, the Osgood Avenue route, didn't really meet the corridor goals, in especially connecting the communities closer to the river. So that was kind of an easy one to cross off. The green route, the one that kind of traveled through Valley View Park, connected into Barker's Alps, actually through Barker's Alps, and through actually the St. Croix SNA, that was something we were super excited about. Unfortunately, the um, working with some of our stakeholders, including the DNR, that's not, uh, the, the regional trail concept isn't something that is a priority for SNA areas. Um, that's not something that they, tip, a service that they provide, that's not the goal they're trying to reach within those properties. So because that kind of came off the table, it didn't make sense to really pursue a route that would continue through that if you're not able to kind of connect it through that. Now, we'll, we'll mention how those routes kind of still found a way to, uh, to be part of the conversation in just a second. But that's where the green route has an X through it. And then there are also a couple of orange routes that we pursued. Um, a couple ones including the Union Pacific Rail Line. We did reach out to them in Anderson Windows about, you know, would, you know is there any timeline on when that, uh, would they continue service, that kind of thing. That was um, a question quickly answered and that they're still, uh, they expect to be in business for many years. Uh, they even said they expect to increase business um, in, the, in the future. So uh, seeing as that didn't seem like a, anything more than a very, very long-term potential, we decided to cross that off. And then additionally, we had some routes that kind of wrapped around or through the Minnesota Corrections Facility working with them. That wasn't something they were interested in, in um, pursuing further. So some of the easier low-hanging fruit. Now phase two, once again, that was kind of the grading the segments. Really, the segments that, that really came out of that process is that 95 route and then that stagecoach route, which is, I think, pink and purple on this map. In addition, we graded out some of these orange connections, too. And once again, we'll, we'll zoom in on that in the next map here, so stay with me through that. This is a zoomed-in portion of kind of what came out of that, that, that phase two analysis. And this is a similar map that we showed at the council, council workshop in January. We really, uh, these are some of the highlights of the conversation from that. Um, these are the notes that really I took back and, and um, really uh, influenced some of the, the routes that, that came out of this process. So, and I did this similar process with other city, other city councils as well. So the first was uh, your comments on that, on the County Road 21 or that stagecoach route. You guys identified some of the benefits of that, including it being in the county right away. There's a lot less driveways to deal with there, and that's something kind of the limited conflicts is something folks are looking for when they're um, using trails. Um, they, you identified um, how important it is that a route would have to connect to downtown, how far that route is from downtown, and how important it would be to connect folks to downtown. We'll talk about some strategies that we use to address that in just a second as well. And then you also talked about an important destination for the communities, Bar Barker Alps, and how important that is too. The Trunk Highway 95 route, the purple route here, you guys mentioned uh, working with MnDOT on, the, on that corridor relatively recently, and something that came out of that project process was some of the real difficulties with adding a significant trail um, within that corridor. And that included um, impacts from, for property and business owners within that corridor. And you also highlighted safety. This is one of the key words that came out of the conversation. How do you cross 95? Um, even along 95, how can we make sure folks using this trail are safe? And that was really important for this group. And so what we talked about and what we looked at was an option off of 95. And this is that second street <coughs> option. Um, that's kind of the dashed line that you see here. And that that might be a better, better alternative. We also looked at Main Street as well, but um, with some of the feedback we worked with you guys and, and the city administrator on, um, that second street seemed like a better option than Main Street just with the right of way available. Also, we highlighted some infrastructure needs along 2nd Avenue with Para Creek there, an opportunity to improve that in addition to some city-owned right-of-way for the kind of, that follows along the 2nd the Street. 
Um, and you also highlighted some challenges with that, including some significant trail impacts for property owners along that corridor too. It's a little limited right away there. Um, and then lastly, we talked about some of those orange those orange routes, those connections, loops, and opportunities. Places like Pickett Avenue, Fifth Avenue, and Second Avenue as potential connectors for either one. No matter what route it is, these could be potentials for kind of both corridors. So out of that process, we came with three routes. We had Route A, Route B, Route C. I'm going to briefly review those. I kind of uh, previewed them a little bit here. This is really the, the 95 route. Um, we're following uh, kind of, uh, Highway 95, especially through Bayport. Um, but what we're doing here is uh, using that Second Street option that I just highlighted there. The pictures here kind of show where Second Street and you have Parrow Creek next to it. Something that was really exciting about this option is working with the Watershed District on um, doing some improvements to that creek. They've had issues with uh, the properties there, um, with, with flooding. Um, obviously, a creek doesn't really look like that, now, so like renaturalizing that river could be a really cool opportunity. Slowing that water down, a lot of water quality benefits is in some tough condition, so there could be um, some improvements uh, for that road as well. And it, you might have some space if you made that into a runway to really have a trail. You know, you have a nice, cool creek, a trail, and a road. That really, that really excited us. It seemed mm -hmm. like a really cool idea. We continue to pursue this option further. Um, however, when uh, the challenges came, and as this group really pointed out on, on January, is when you get back to 95, um, from, you know, once you get, if you're able to connect back onto 95, there's some significant challenges. So I wanna kind of draw your attention to that other picture, that lower picture there. And you can see that um, you've got a shoulder, uh, and then you've got a significant grade change, and then the rail, right, to your, to your left or to uh, yeah, to the east. And then you've kind of got a big slope and, um, and a shoulder and a big slope on the other side of the road. And the space here is very, very challenging. Not impossible, but when we're talking about trails that have an eye towards implementation for future implementation, we're talking about cost burdens, things like that, um, we saw that this is a very significant challenge to overcome is um, you know it's tough enough to get through that downtown Bayport piece but once you come out of downtown Bayport the room just doesn't really work especially for a 10-foot trail with uh, the type of separation that you would need for snow storage and for safety so what would really probably the most plausible option there would be m moving the whole road over and then fitting a trail there and um, that's the engineer was were telling me and so that's what made this option very 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 difficult to recommend mm -hmm. you can kind of see it crossed off. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to talk more about this option, but that's what made this option particularly challenging. Um, though it did have some really interesting and exciting opportunities as well. So I want to highlight Route B. This is the state, really a, a stagecoach option. Uh, brings us up to stagecoach just north of 36 um, with kind of a connection that wraps around the, uh, the stormwater pond that's there. If folks are familiar, that's kind of the, the middle picture there. We kind of follow Stagecoach all the way down to 94, and there's another really exciting opportunity south of 94. We worked with Bellin Conservancy, and they were interested in um, potentially working with us to have a regional trail route wind through their properties. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of see it a little bit on this map, but mm -hmm. they have some continuous property that gets you all the way down to Afton um, from that, that spot on 94. And that that might reach some of their goals that they're looking for, and uh, a beautiful regional route that brings you off of the road completely through beautiful prairie, um, they've got some um, wetlands, they have bison even out there. Um, the opportunity to provide people with a trail experience there was really exciting for us too. So that's, uh, that's one of the highlights of this route here. And then Route C. The highlight for this one is really using existing trails within the corridor. So obviously that Bellwin route, um, expensive, big, uh, or significantly long, um, and not built today. But we do have an existing route south of 94 that kind of connects through Lakeland all the way down to Afton. So we designate that existing route as the regional route. Um, and then additionally, uh, in kind of the Bayport, Oak Park Heights area, designating that route that kind of comes off of the St. Croix Crossing Loop Trail up onto Stagecoach, um, just as you get on the other side of 36. But that's an existing connection that exists there today. So kind of using those existing connections where possible in order to kind of make the most uh, feasible route um, as far as implementation and existing trails within the corridor. Okay, so weighing all this out, working with our partners, 
people who are on the committee and, and talking this through a little bit, um, we'd like to recommend kind of the following designations. This is kind of a, a way that we're able to kind of get the best of both worlds a little bit here. One is to um, designate a long-term regional route, kind of designating uh, segments of the trail that uh, um, may take longer to develop, but still fit within our project goals. In the interim, we can use some of those existing connections that I highlighted in Route C to be the kind of the connection that exists there today that people can continue to use while we pursue some of the other options. So that's where you get that um, connection just south of 36 um, in Oak Park Heights, and then also the, the one in Afton, uh, where you have an existing trail that brings you into downtown Afton. So we will continue to we'll highlight those trails and those will serve in the interim while we work on some of the other long-term segments. Um, so there's some advantages of this. One is, is it allows us to pursue those funding opportunities for, those, for the long range route. And in the meantime, people can continue to use those interim routes that exist there today. So I wanna zoom in on the recommended route as it pertains to Bayport itself, um, or the Bayport area, I guess, and some of the surrounding communities. You can see here that the long-term route here is the stagecoach route here that would establish a new trail for folks in, um, in this area. And then the in, um, as you continue south, um, I do wanna highlight where you see these eyes, or uh, little points of interest. And points of interest um, would be those opportunities to do that wayfinding and interpretive signage. To let folks know kind of where they are on the trail, what are some re uh, nearby destinations that they can connect to and to really like draw people into uh, different branches that are branching in and out of this tree trunk, for example. And uh, the idea here is to, to highlight some of the potential connections that were highlighted in our master uh, planning process, but can serve as some of those connectors. So those are these red lines here, Pickett Avenue, uh, Fifth Ave and Second Ave. Those seem to kind of rise to the top as potential uh, connections from a stagecoach route into downtown Bayport um, or a combination of them as well. And we wanted to highlight and include those in the master plan as important key aspects of this trail, knowing that we can't just think of this trail as A to B, but A to B with uh, opportunities for those branches. Um, so we, heard, we, we, we thought this is the best way to address that connection piece that seemed to be a priority of the council and for many folks that we talked to in the public as well, is to identify some of these connection pieces for um, future consideration. So can you help me understand then what the red dotted arrows actually mean in this map? Yeah, those are highlighting connector routes. So those are like not your responsibility, someone else's responsibility if we want to connect them? Right, okay. essentially, yeah. <laughs> um, these are routes that folks uh, thought would be good opportunities to connect into downtown Bayport. Gotcha. Um, but ultimately the local uh, local roads with, with local uh, responsibilities with them. And then the, the beach road at the very top, yes. how, how does it connect to the actual existing trail? I guess it's just a purple arrow that goes down, but is yeah. that something that has to still be built to yep. connect that? Okay. Yep, I can zoom in on that. Here is that top one, is that top trail. So you maybe are familiar with the St. Croix Crossing Loop Trail yeah. on 95 on the east side. It'd be a new connection that would um, kind of uh, wrap around the other side of 95 and wrap up to Beach Avenue okay. and cross at Beach Avenue instead of underneath the bridge. Okay, thank you. As we move south and kind of out of downtown Bayport, uh, but still relevant for folks, we wanted to highlight some of those loops, loop opportunities and how important that was for folks. Um, once, once again, these are uh, branches off of the, the main tree trunk route but thought that they would be important enough to identify in this study as well. Um, you can see kind of the Quarry Quant Avenue loop as potential, a, a Second Street or 22nd Street and Quarry uh, loop potential, and then the connection into 94 in, in, in the Wisconsin Trail system, and then also kind of on the south side of 94, that connection uh, in between a potential route in uh, Belwyn and that uh, County Road 18 route that I mentioned earlier. Once again, uh, kind of at each of these jurisdictions, we have opportunities to do some signing uh, and wayfinding and interpretive signage for folks um, to navigate that corridor and also to call out um, certain destinations and aspects within the corridor that are especially unique. 
So uh, these are the next steps that we're proposing here. It's for the city to consider a resolution of support. We'll continue to kind of tweak and finalize this plan development. So I'm happy to take com comments today as well. We'll continue that engagement on the staff level as well and looking for a final approval process to go in front of our county board in June and the Metropolitan Council in July. Happy to take any questions about this process and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, John. Um, you know, I, I, part of the process, we've been involved in the process a couple times along the way, um, and, and I think you guys have done your due diligence. Um, that being said, quite frankly, Bayport gets skipped over mm -hmm. in this. We it's, do. It's not super attractive to us. So I guess what I would be looking at from you guys is a way that we could have some continuity for for example, for those red dots. So if we wanted to pursue something, something that's gonna kind of, signage is gonna match up and have it be kind of a continuous, um, you know, really seem part of the trail mm -hmm. rather than just mm -hmm. kind of a Bayport afterthought, we're gonna shove in this connector trail. And frankly, I, I understand all the challenges. It's a bugger, so I was really mm -hmm. curious when, when this came out to look at it and how, what the solution was. Um, it's just for, for most of us to jump on that trail with our bikes, you know, it's a, it's not right there ready for us to jump on unless maybe you're in inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, us lower That's Bayport folks don't really have a great opportunity to take advantage of this trail. So, but thank you for the presentation. Yeah, like if you could make a loop <clears throat> in Bayport would be the best option. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do see that it's hard because you, there's, you can't really get back up with what we have there. But also like, yeah, I mean, I think Fifth Avenue is hard too because even if it's that sidewalk, there's not a sidewalk all the way there mm -hmm. you know like the sidewalk ends before we get to barkers by two blocks you'd have to be on right? the north it, side of fifth yeah it is I a county know. road though so maybe there's something yeah, we could do it is a county there. Road. mayor hansen yeah can i comment on this yes um so we've had conversations with the county about potentially adding sidewalk um along fifth avenue because there is kind of a disconnect there um they would be willing to allow us to do that in the short term or work with us in the long term whenever that road gets um, reconstructed essentially. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that oh. any any um, connection on Fifth Avenue there um, definitely could be done at the time that that road is reconstructed. I mean, we're looking at a probably 20 or 30 year plan here versus a you know five to 10 year plan. Mm -hmm. um, I do think the Second Avenue uh, connection if we would promote that more potentially as like a city route that could get bike to and somehow designate it and show it like say on the city website or you know as the potential of leading to essentially the regional trail to go through barkers and then to potentially meet up on fifth avenue there where it comes out of barkers mm -hmm. um that we could definitely do a lot better job of uh just promoting the trails in our own city, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's so, not technically a trail, Second Avenue. Is, but that's no, saying. I'm like, saying the connection kind of at Barker's Alps. Yeah. Correct, right. We, you'd obviously have to use the road, but right. as that being a trailhead or something mm -hmm. at the end of uh, Second Avenue there, that would definitely promote um, an easy option for at least downtown people who are on the west, or west side of 95. Sure. Fairly easy access to, right? So, yeah. yeah. That's the logical connection yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, it really doesn't get you, like, we're still missing a, a nice direct route to Stillwater and like Browns Creek Trail and all of that because you're still going west and then coming kind of back east to get, you know, I mean, like, yeah. I don't see, like my husband who's a big biker, I don't see him using that connection to get there. He's still gonna go on 95 and, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, and I think this trail, faster. like Connor indicated, sorry Madam Mayor, but, um, like uh, Connor had indicated, this is probably more of a recreational right. trail, right? Rather than a, hey, I'm going to go bike yes. 30 miles trail. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Which I get it. There was a lot of things to weigh, and you definitely did a good job of looking at every option. Um, so, Mayor, I just appreciate the comment on Fifth Avenue. I just want to echo what 
Administrator Klein mentioned. It, yeah. it is on, Fifth Avenue is on uh, the uh, county's bike and pedestrian plan uh, for a, you know, for improvements for trails. So that is something that was already in a document even before this master plan as an investment that the county would look for. Once again, when it makes sense for a, for a road reconstruction for that project. Okay. So this would be another plan that would speak to the importance of a trail connection uh, for the county to pursue with, with that with a project with a future project along that corridor. Great. Okay. Does anyone else have comments or questions for Connor? No. Okay. I, I know we did come to you and say if you can do the trail through our downtown and make it safe, that would be the best. So we, <laughs> we gave you really a tough tried. challenge. We did. It too. Yes, we, really we did. We wanted everything. And I think it is going to make, you know, inspiration is part of Bayport and those people are going to have a nice access. Do you know what side of Stagecoach you would envision this trail going on based on what you guys did your boots on the ground kind of look? Yeah, the great thing with master plans is Either one Could be either <laughs> right one. now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We looked at both sides. Both kind of have plus, you know, positives and negatives for it. And so this trick or this uh, plan won't identify specifically one side or the other. It'll just call out some of those advantages. Okay. Cause um, then I'm just thinking one side Baytown, Bay Bay yeah, one, one side Bayport. Bayport. Yep. So and that's affect... one of the things that's on the list too. <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause then I assume we're in on the 50% if it's on the East side. It's on the west side. Is right. it not our responsibility then? So we'll we'll work with jurisdictions when we're right on the border like that to yeah. figure something out that works for all all parties. That's how we've approached it on other trails. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good thing. Good question. Think about. Go west side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So I guess we can let Connor go then. Thank right? you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, Thank you. Very Thank much. you very much for coming. I think that was really good. I mean, we all had a lot of background at other meetings. I know John and I went to the, we were in a picture even at one of our the meetings and then he came and talked to us preliminarily. So nice to get all of this out in front of all the residents who you know watch this or, so that, that was great. So thank you for all that background too. I know we've heard it before, but we needed to do it, so. All right, so is there anyone else we, now I see there's more people in the audience from when we started. Is anyone else out there that wants to speak to us during the open forum? Is that what you're here for, Han? Well, I did hear in your research. Come on up, wait, yeah. Jim, Jim, gotta follow the protocol. Come on up, tell us who you are, where <laughs> you live. Know you I know, Jim we know. Jim Gardner, 771 North 5th Street. All right. Um, I didn't hear in your research that there is an existing snowmobile trail on County Road 21. Mm -hmm. That wasn't mentioned. I didn't hear it anyways. So how would you, would that be handled like the Hardwood Creek Trail? Connor, do you want to get up and sure. answer so everyone can I mean, hear? Yep. That's been there for okay. 20 yeah. years. So. All right. Mayor, Thanks, council so. members, uh, to address that question, thank you for it. That was uh, um, the, the snowmobile trail system in Washington County was one of the layers we identified and looked through in this analysis. And it was shared with us the public that that is a corridor that um, we would look for to not impact with a trail. So once again, you'd have a um, segments where you're you may have a paved trail, but we'll, but you'd have another path for um, uh, snowmobiles if that's um, if if that's of interest for the local city that we're working through with the uh, for the specific segment of trail that we're working through on Stagecoach. Hmm. So something that. Uh, we will address and call out in the plan, um, but we'll address kind of in that preliminary design stage whenever we get there, which once again could be five years, could be 25 years. Yeah. So it sounds like you're well aware We're of aware. the trail yes, and yeah. you're not going to you. take it away. <laughs> yes. What, yep. Okay, great. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Make sure that's in writing, right, Kim? <laughs> okay. Great. All right, I don't think there's anyone else out there that could possibly want to talk to us. I think I know why Nathan's mm -hmm. here, so. All right, um, so on to the consent agenda. We're gonna consider a resolution adopting items one through nine, the April 3rd City Council workshop minutes, the April 3rd City Council regular meeting minutes, April payables and receipts, April building, plumbing, mechanical, and zoning permits report, a donation request for $500 from the Bayport American Legion for the Memorial Day Parade, 
lawful gambling application from United Way for a raffle at the Legion on June 24th. Uh, pay application number four from Pioneer Power for the Booster Station Improvement Project. Special event application from the Legion for the flag ceremony at Peril Park on June 14th. It says 2022, but I think it's supposed to say three. Resolution of support for Middle St. Croix Valley Regional Trail Master Plan. Um, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion approving the consent okay, agenda. Thanks, Connie. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Thank you, John. All right. So we need a roll call. Councilmember Carlson. Aye. Councilmember Gilmore. Aye. Councilmember Dahl. Aye. Councilmember Hill. Aye. Mayor Hansen. Aye. All ayes. Thanks. There's no public hearings. There's no unfinished business. There's no new business. So we're on to city council liaison reports. So should we start with Katie this time? Okay. Let me get it up. Sorry. All right. <laughs> it's all right. I surprised you. I did miss it because of traffic on 694, but you missed I do what? Have their meeting for the BCAL meeting. Oh, you did. Oh, okay. yes. Gotcha. I was on my way there and stuff. Okay. And I didn't get to go either. But I, I, I know the one time. Yeah, I know. I do have their meeting minutes. It's, um, they are working now that the Easter egg hunt's done. They are working on the bar crawl, which is just about all ready and set up. That will be on May 13th. Uh, the ice cream social, the library is going to be there. Jill at the library is excited about that. Uh, that's going to be June 7th on a Wednesday at Lakeside Park. Uh, farmers markets getting up and ready. It'll start in June, go through October, be at the city uh, green again. And the garage sale. So if you want to be in the garage sale, it should be um, your map. If you want to be on the map, Get signed up early because uh, I think eventually you can still sign up but you just won't be on the map anymore and then Derby days they're still going all about which is September 15th and 16th great all right sounds good and John you missed the Michelle watershed one because I went attend. Did Those secret watershed, we have not received our meeting minutes. So I know. I was like, the, oh, the that trick with that, that's okay. That assignment is it's always the Thursday after I know. the regular council meeting. So you have to remember, remember. like almost a month. I used yes. to just scribble notes down because that was. And I thought I would have the minutes. The minutes was always okay. sketchy. Do you so. have any other liaison appointments? Or would that no. Be it? That's okay. It. All right. So I did attend the. Should we just go to me since I did it? Um, I did attend that watershed, so Middle St. Croix Watershed Management on April 13th. Um, not a lot about Bayport. I think the only thing that really came up that pertained to us was about some additional sweeping of streets that we could do and some grants that may be coming through. And I'm sure Matt knows more about that than I do or maybe even some of the people at that meeting. Um, I also attended on April 10th the Bayport Fire Department Relief Association board meeting. Their funds are doing really well, and everything seems to be at least uh, on target, if not beating some of the benchmarks for financials. They're working on getting the, some calendar sponsors, and um, some. we also discussed opportunities for some professional development for the board members. There's a new board member that needs some, some additional training hours. Um, April 13th, I went to the open house for the Middle St. Croix Valley Regional Trail Master Plan that was at the courthouse. It was nice to see quite a few Bayport people there. So we got some feedback in from them, I'm sure. And April 17th and 24th, I went to the facilities planning team meetings for the school district. Um, did a tour of a brand new elementary school in Hugo to kind of get a feel for what they look like and um, just trying to help them as a team member advise about how they should go about the referendum in November. And then I went to both the two of the three library reopening events. I missed the one that was on the day of the Easter egg hunt and Easter weekend because I was tough, but wonderful. They did a great job. Lots of friendly faces there. And then a bunch of us got to go on a prison tour on the 26th, which I thought it was amazing. I'm sorry you missed it. John missed it. Very Katie, sad I missed it. Ethan, I um, 
Sarah, Matt were, the, were there, and then um, Officer Slinger. And I thought it was very informative. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think we got to see the whole prison, but just, and they gave us a, a fact sheet and we even got um, a copy of the prison mirror, the, the publication that the prisoners put out. So, cool. and you, I looked on the back, you can subscribe. Oh, you so, can. yeah, it was like $25 for a subscription. Nice. I want to do it. So, anyway, so thank you to the prison staff. I did send a, just for, on behalf of all of us a quick thank you note to them for, for taking the time to do that. So, it was awesome. So, Ethan, did you uh, get to cable meet cable commission? Cable commission did not meet, so I have nothing to report. Did you? Okay, the library board did meet on the 18th, and all the grand opening events were wonderful. Well they attended. Were. We even made the Channel 4 news with the first ribbon cutting, which we didn't realize he was out there. Well, we knew the camera guys. We just didn't know it was Channel 4 news. Um, and then uh, Jill was very happy. The night at the library, she said, was there was about 50 to 60 people that attended it. And she was pleased with that. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, she's excited, the story time. Well, anyway, lots of positive feedback about the library. For sure. People are really enjoying it. And the story time, she's had great attendance for that. She's really um, gearing up the summer reading program. They're gonna be at the farmer's market a few times. And then they had, and Michelle, she told me you attended um, the play, The Fortune Cookie. Yesterday. Yeah, through the big read. And she said it was very good. and the discussion afterwards was really good so she was excited and she's hoping to have more programs I guess it's put on through remember project I think is what she said yeah so um, I think that's about it but she was very pleased with all the events being attended and um, with the story time attendance going up and all the feedback she got yeah it's been great publicity yeah. I think she's probably gonna get even more people coming to some of those events because yeah. of all so, the ribbon cuttings and everything so yeah, excellent. And I have to say, I was lucky enough to be in the library because my personal computer is not working, so I had to use a computer at the library one day, and one of the classrooms came in because our mm -hmm. kids from the elementary school go in there, and it was their first time being in the new library, mm -hmm. and I got to watch all their faces go, <gasps> every time when they walked in. It was, it, was, it was really fun. So, yes, and thank you to Jill for all of her hard work. She's, you know, that's definitely not her... Um, background is not in planning a renovation, and she did that all very well. So, right on top. yes, all right. So, now, um, staff and city administrator reports. Matt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Fire Chief Eisinger. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council members. Uh, the month of April call volume was 102 compared to 96 in 2022. Our year to date uh, call volume is 377 compared to 317. Uh, monthly drills were Manitou, Manitou tests, quarterly SCBA, and quarterly EMR uh, mods. Fire inspections are ongoing as well as uh, new plan reviews. We had, our, as Mayor mentioned, our relief association meeting, our officers meeting. The storm damage, we're still working through some stuff on that with our townships and that, with some of the burning and moving and all that stuff. Uh, anniversaries for uh, this month are Dustin Vincent, eight years, Brandon Johnson, 17 years, Jake Vindahl, 19 years, and myself, 22 years, wow. as well as Jason Severson with 28 years. Um, we had Washington County Fire Chiefs uh, meeting uh, this month and fire improvement team, as well as the Memorial Day. I did attend the FDIC conference last week with uh, Assistant Chief Severson and uh, firefighter Adam Staffney and I took eight great classes. I already shared some information with Administrator Klein that's gonna help us move forward and making sure we're planning for the future. Good. Thanks so with for that, I stand for questions. Great, thanks for taking the time out of your personal life to go attend those kinds of things. And, and it's a city. great Good. conference, like 8,000 in attendance. And wow. I got to interact with the state fire marshal who helped us get some information forwarded to Administrator Klein, so it's great. It's great mm -hmm. networking. Awesome. Um, but although it did bring some concerns because of uh, changes through the, our emissions and that, we found out that our fire trucks, the diesel engines that are go into our fire trucks 
are going to go up $100,000 in 2026, which mm. we haven't planned. That we didn't know that. They did have six electric fire trucks there. Yes, they were. But at a tune of over $2 million a piece, we didn't plan for that. So, Is there funding out there if you go electric or anything? You, no. you can get some grants, but they're far and few between. Okay. But in addition to the electric fire trucks, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know some departments are spending up to eighty to $200,000 to put the electrical supply in there to charge them. I so suppose you have to. It's, it's a great, you know, for our environment and that, but it's for you folks who have to pay the bills, it's going to be a headache for you. Yeah. So what have you had to do with the storm damage? What, what well, were you referencing? Well, that actual, that storm, the day we had 32 calls. And oh, then we're helping gotcha. uh, in Baytown, a lot of the remote townships are, the residents are applying for burning permits to burn the brush. Oh, Obviously in Oak Park and Bayport, there's just not enough space to burn it. So yeah. now the countywide brush pile and administrator client, do you remember when that's going to, was 30 days, it's going to be over in a week or two. The one that they have at Bellwin or? or up yes. At, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so, it's on it's on the county website. Um, I would check there. I can't remember offhand yeah, either. Um, what day? Um, I kind of feel like it was over in April. Like the last date was in April. Yeah, day it too, could but... be either over or coming real quick. So, okay. But check the site. And that was that. Obviously, it's in West Lake One Township where the pile is. So yeah, they let you bring brush there if you aren't understanding what we're talking about. You yeah. can bring it there for free. So check the county website if you want to know more about that. Yes. Any other questions? Congratulations on 22 years. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your service. It's awesome. We'll have a good night. You too. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Chief. So. Thank you, Chief. Chief Eastman. Good evening again, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, past events, we had a cold weather night qualification shoot required by Oak Park Heights um, prison range required by the post board, and that was all officers. Um, we had the life-saving recipients, which were Officer Lepowski and Officer Slinger last time. Uh, also on the third, we had a accommodation for Officer Cornell. And on the 26th, we trained um, on pepperball chemical and Narcan training. Um, upcoming events, May 29th, we of course have the parade. Um, I know Public Works will be pounding in uh, parking, no parking signs will be um, putting waivers, uh, flyers on their, either on their cars or in their door. Um, we'll also be um, having everyone in, all officers, all reserves uh, for the route. And we look forward to that 8.30 start time. Um, I forgot to add a couple things. We assist Anderson Elementary with the bike to school, which is Wednesday, May 3rd. So we'll be at certain intersections. They come out of Inspiration, come down 6th, then we we're at uh, 6th and 2nd Avenue to make sure they're safe. And then the kids coming from Oak Park go down the bike trail to 5th and then crossing over 5th Avenue. We, we help make sure they're safe there. Um, and then the picnic as well, Anderson Carbonell Carnival Picnic. We will be present there with, uh, um, we're hoping to maybe get uh, the dog over there for a little bit. Mm. Just a brief few hello mm. and goodbye. And then, um, our incidents to date are 2,252 as compared to roughly 2,000 last year. And I stand for questions. So they canceled the lift bridge race? They did. Do you know why, Matt? Madam Mayor, technically they didn't cancel the race. They actually moved it to Stillwater where the lift bridge actually exists. Oh. It started there. Yeah, that's so what it, so we're the out first the year loop. it started in Stillwater and they continue to call it the lift bridge race. So we are canceled as staff because that was all hands on deck, so. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, any more questions? I look like it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, Assistant Administrator Taylor. Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, staff will be meeting tomorrow to finalize updates to the city's floodplain ordinance, which incorporates minimum state and federal standards for floodplain communities to be in compliance with the insurance program. Um, the ordinance is scheduled to be considered by the Planning Commission at a public hearing on May 22nd. Uh, the application deadline for the Public Works Director position is May 10th. Interviews are anticipated for the week of May 15th. 
with a recommendation for a hire to be considered by the City Council at the June 5th meeting. The City also has an opening for a part-time library clerk position with an application deadline of May 9th. Individuals interested in the position are encouraged to contact Library Director Jill Smith for details. Uh, the City is coordinating with Tennis Sanitation and other recycling partners to hold a curbside collection of waste and recyclables during the week of June 12th. Residents should watch for a flyer by mail in late May with cleanup details as well as other recycling and disposal resources. Uh, today is the official kickoff for Normal May, which is a community volunteer initiative that encourages residents to suspend lawn mowing for the month of May in order to create habitat and food for bees, butterflies, and birds. Uh, residents interested in participating should register at City Hall and they can pick up a cute yard sign to promote the program. <laughs> mm -hmm. They come with poles too. <laughs> yes, we do yes. have. Um, yeah. Um, I think that's it for me. I'll stand for questions. Can I have a yard sign? Yeah, I got some. Yes, yeah. yeah. behind her. Right. Thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. Um, I guess that leaves mine left. Um, I just have a couple things. Um, one of the big ones again this year is uh, just to give or this year, this month, uh, give <laughs> feels credit like to. A year. Feels like a year, yeah. <laughs> right. um, Been here a long time. <laughs> Uh, just to give more credit to the public works staff and administrative staff again for uh, the, just the past month, actually, again, uh, the April snowstorm and you know, storm debris, along with the river flooding, has really inundated staff, um, both from the public works side and the admin sign, or side, um, admin answering phone calls, um, and public works staff uh, just doing cleanup, essentially, um, not to mention some of the... Um, everyday tasks that we do, uh, which includes hydrant flushing in the spring, street sweeping, um, obviously from the admin side, managing park reservations and building permits and zoning matters. Um, I will say that um, there's a lot of information on both of these circumstances, the river flooding um, and the storm debris. And I would say probably about 50 to 60% of the questions that we get on a daily basis could be answered just by going to the city website. So I encourage people to do that before they call. Um, not that you can't call City Hall, but I think your answers could be, uh, our questions could be answered very quickly. Um, speaking of storm debris cleanup, um, St. Croix Save Tree continues to go on around on um, essentially um, their timeline um, because of costs and other cities needing um, service. Um, we kind of allowed them to uh, pick up as, as they have time, which means they're doing it in the afternoons when they have only a half full truck or on the weekends. Um, and I think they've done a fairly good job on um, moving that process forward. Um, the public work staff, along with STS crews, Washington County Sentence to Serve crews, um, are also chipping um, as we can. Um, we're kind of focusing on the, some of the smaller piles, and that's why you might see one pile gone and a bigger pile just remaining. So um, don't worry, residents, we, we are still uh, in the process of um, completing some of that work. Um, technically, our uh, city lot um, has closed at this point for storm debris, um, which I think will keep that closed for now. Um, we're not seeing a huge influx anymore of storm debris. Um, a lot of people actually took their stuff down there. That pile is massive right now. Really? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, eventually that will, um, in order for it to qualify for potential reimbursement from the state, we actually have to chip that rather than actually getting rid of it. Um, so at some point we'll have a, a big chipping unit down there, probably contracted out to get that done. What do we do with all the chipped wood? So if we normally, on any given year, we have a couple piles of chippings and people actually come down a lot mm -hmm. and take it. Usually we can count on not even having to to ever get rid of it um, because people just come and use it. So, which is nice to offer that. Um, that pile is likely that we would have it shipped out and um, uh, just taken away. So. Yeah, hopefully it goes to some good use. Like, does somebody burn it or do something with it? Yeah, know. I'm not sure what they do to it, um, but hopefully, yeah, some good use. Um, we do have a chip pile that's currently down at, in the boneyard. Um, south of the Public Works Department, um, and people are more than welcome to come and take some as they see fit. Mm -hmm. um, 
The other one that Mayor wanted me to touch on is the river flooding. Um, so I got some statistics together here. Um, current levels of the river are 686 and a half feet. Um, normal pool is about 675, so it's still about uh, 11 feet over normal pool. Um, it is no longer considered flood stage. That happens at 687 feet. Um, we peaked at about 689 and a half feet, um, which is about one foot higher than 2019 and unofficially the seventh highest crest on record. Um, so uh, fairly high, but um, based on the, um, the flood potential this year, um, I think we got fairly lucky. I think they have a hard time calculating um, at least the people who make the predictions it was very dry and so the soils weren't wet mm -hmm. and there was not a lot of frost um, and the spring lasted quite a while so we got lucky this year mm -hmm. um, we filled about 5600 sandbags between the icwc prison crew the stillwater prison and washington county sts and we delivered about 4300 sandbags to residents um, I want to encourage um, residents to, um, you can call in and we can do pickup procedures. Um, so just call City Hall to set that up. Um, that's going to be on a, a, our time basis, which means it's probably not going to get done this week or next week. So whenever we have time, probably on Fridays um, to do that. And do we pick up sandbags that have already like been touched by the river? Yes, yeah, so we will. Okay. Um, essentially, those are going to have to get um, either landfilled or um, taken away um, and disposed of properly. Um, so we'll be charging 50 cents a sandbag. Um, a lot of our residents who have that happen where it touches them, um, there's a couple of residents who want fill anyway, and so they actually use them on their property. Mm -hmm. So um, flood prep hours, just the public works department has 61 and a half hours in, mm -hmm. uh, in the four weeks that it's been going on roughly. And I would say you could probably double that uh, or just as much for admin hours. Yeah. Um, so it's significant prep time for it. Um, that includes hauling sandbags, uh, just for public works, hauling sandbags, delivering sandbags, barricades, um, keeping an eye on some of the sewer system um, for inflow, a um, couple of, um, of street items. Um, it came within about one foot of essentially having water across Point Road and Fifth Avenue South. Um, which we, we got lucky. Um, having water across the road definitely limits our public safety access in those locations. Um, we'll be looking for future possibilities on at least Fifth Avenue South of temporary building up that road and getting permission <coughs> from the railroad tracks to do that, or from the, from the railroad to do that. So have that ready ahead of time in case it happens in yes, the future. Yes, right, where we gr are already granted permission and there, there's a plan in place. That would be great. So, um, we did document with pictures quite a bit of the alley that's just off of Minnesota 95 where some of the more significant um, flooding occurs. Um, so our hope is to create like a property file for all those properties. So future residents who want to know, hey, how high did it get at the 890 level or um, well, 890. Yeah, 690 <laughs> level, 890, yeah. Um, they can actually uh, look that up um, on the city website or something like that. I think so. that's an awesome are you, idea. Are you familiar, aware of any properties in town that su suffered significant damage from this flood? I am not. Um, six, the 689 and a half level um, doesn't quite get into residents' houses. Um, a fair amount of basements definitely yeah. get affected, yeah. but I think people do a good job of cleaning out their basement. Most of the ones that do get flooded basements have already prepped. Um, they know that it floods, so um, with our initial letter, they're already starting to get stuff out of there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, news. not significant. Um, a lot of garages and different stuff like that along the alley. So, just a big mess. Yeah, yeah. right. Yep. Um, that's about all I got for. Uh, that stand for questions okay you did skip past the fire contract i don't know if you needed wanted to say anything about it but um i i can yeah. i'm meeting with um the city administrator for oak park heights tomorrow just oh, to go over okay. some of the language in the rfp oh. um so we'll see how that goes um you know we're trying to do a cooperative effort to, um with a fire study with all four member cities um i've provided at least some content already for the rfp and so we're gonna 
um, talk about that tomorrow. Oh, great. Okay, so that's still moving ahead. Good. Because uh, he has, the city administrator for Oak Park Heights has put in his um, notice that his last day will be September 5th. So I just didn't know if yep. that would hold up our process. Mm -hmm. So that in case you hadn't that. heard. That's interesting news. Isn't it? Yes. Interesting news. I know. Okay, so um, I guess that's it. Unless anyone has any other announcements or items they want to chat about, and then we can go back to our, okay. All right. Anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. All right. Thank Second. you. Second. Thank you, John. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Thank you.